Alrighty, hey everyone, thanks for joining. I think, I think this evening should be pretty fun. Um, so we're gonna talk about how to go about auditing Windows Defender application control deployments. Uh, and from there, we'll transition into uh, some of my thought process around bypassing Defender application control enforcement. Um, going about doing this is, um, it's, it's a really broad topic um, and there's a lot of facets to consider. So in the relatively brief amount of time that we have, I'll try to cover as many scenarios as possible, but just don't, don't be disappointed if I don't get to a particular uh, bypass strategy that maybe you're interested in. But um, if there is one in particular that you'd like for me to speak to, uh, definitely speak up in chat and I'll see what I can do to try to address that. And um, just be clear, pretty much any bypass that we're gonna cover here um, is likely to be covered by um, a mitigation. Um, I would probably caveat that with one exception which we'll cover, but it's an issue that Microsoft has, has known about. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, what I'm gonna do in this stream is I'm gonna do my best to not assume that everyone joining in has all the prerequisite knowledge that we've established over previous streams. So I don't expect you to be um, Defender application control or even PowerShell experts for that matter. Um, so if there are if, if there are any questions along the way, um, certainly certainly ask. I would love for this to be as interactive as as possible. So um, I did mention previously. So let's let's start with uh, auditing. So let's let's pretend we're an attacker and we just landed on a box. And we'd like to know if Defender Application Control is enabled, whether it's in audit mode or enforcement mode. Um, it would be nice to, to know what we're going up against in this potential high security environment. So a couple ways to do that. One way is I think, it, I think the GUI equivalent is, yeah. So, msinfo.exe, load that up. And in system summary, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see Defender Application Control Policy. All right, so this first one that's highlighted, my understanding is that this corresponds to um, just general enforcement. And so, um, I believe this would correspond to um, uh, driver and kernel mode enforcement. Um, and then the, the, dis the distinction being in, in the second option here that if a user mode policy is explicitly enabled um, and if there's a difference between the two uh, policy enforcements, this is where you would see that. So for example, if Audit, if a, a user mode policy was not explicitly enabled, I would expect this to, I think it would say none. And then if either of these are in enforcement mode, you'd expect it to, to say uh, enforcement. Now, we're not gonna really get into a ton of these protections here, but there are some additional um, Defender Application Control policy protections that you can put in place. For example, you can sign your policies and also have Defender Application Control be protected by um, with virtualization-based security. So uh, at a relatively high level, what that enables is for your code integrity policy to be stored in a UEFI variable. Um, and if it's signed, that's gonna be even better because the only way that you can go about updating or removing your policy is by supplying an updated policy that is signed using the authorized signer. 
So if you don't check those boxes, then the policy is not going to be updated in that UEFI variable. And that UEFI variable persists across reboots. And assuming you have secure boot enabled, um, that policy will always be enforced and it will always be persistent within a UEFI variable. So um, to date, in the previous streams, we've worked with deploying policies to disk, to the code integrity directory. When you enable virtualization-based security, um, Windows will consume that file-based policy, save it to the UEFI variable, and then that is the source of, of truth. Uh, and we'll cover how to audit that if, if that's the case, but we're not gonna really get into the nitty gritty details of how virtualiza virtualization-based security is even implemented because I'm not even an authority on that. So I can't, um, I won't be able to speak to that. Um, so anyway, this is the, the GUI way to go about auditing whether or not Defender Application Control is enabled. Of course, we're gonna talk about the PowerShell way to do things as well. So this is a, this is a built-in commandlet, get computer info. And the last properties here will be device guard, code integrity, policy enforcement status. Um, if you're not aware, device guard is the old name for Windows Defender Application Control. So when you see device guard, think WDAC or Defender Application Control or vice versa. But it reflects the same, um, all of the same stuff that you saw in the GUI, just in PowerShell. Um, next. All right, so we've determined that Defender Application Control on this system is running in audit mode. Um, next, I'd like to um, actually start auditing the, the policies. And so this is where we need to know where policies are stored. And they're gonna be stored in um, one or two locations. The first location is going to be in C Windows System 32 code integrity. All right. Um, in many cases, the policy file that you'll see is going to be within this directory, sipolicy.p7b. Um, you don't see it here because in a previous stream, what I set up was uh, having multiple base policies and those base policies are saved to a different file called a, a CIP file. It's the same uh, binary file format, it's just stored someplace else. So these are stored in CI policies active, okay? So this GUID value corresponds to the policy ID of the code integrity policy. Um, CIP stands for code integrity policy. Again, the actual binary format is identical to these P7B files. And uh, fortunately, uh, I've developed a, a script to recover uh, the XML policy from the, the binary file uh, because unfortunately, Microsoft doesn't supply that. Um, you know, they're, they're nice enough to supply this built-in commandlet, which will take an XML code integrity policy and then convert it to a binary policy, either the P7B or uh, .CIP file. But unfortunately, they don't allow you to go the other way around. Um, not a big deal. Uh, in previous streams, I've shown a lot of my uh, WDAC tools module, so I have that installed here. Let's get a quick refresher of what all is installed here. Um, so what we're going to use to recover the XML policies is the convert to WDAC code integrity policy function. Uh, before we do that, though, I wanted to cover the, the other location where you could potentially find 
uh, deployed code integrity policies. So, for example, in the case where virtualization-based security is protecting your code integrity policies, uh, like via the UFI variable storage, oftentimes you'll find the relevant code integrity policy in the EFI system partition. All right. So by default in Windows, uh, the EFI system partition is not going to have a mounted drive. So we would need to mount that drive. And there's PowerShell way to do it. Uh, there's GUI ways to do it. Um, there's there's a disk part to do that. Um, since I'm kind of a PowerShell purist, we'll, we'll use PowerShell to do that. So I'm just gonna enumerate the partitions. Oh yeah, yeah, actually before this, I, I had already set the, the drive letter for this. Um, but what I did to set that was this. So I took the partition number. So here's the system partition. Um, and drive letter was blank previously. So I just um, referenced the, uh, partition number two, since I see that is that is indeed the EFI system partition. And then I pipe that to set partition, and then you specify new drive letter, and I gave it S, okay? It already tells me that it's in use, that's fine. And now I should I should have that drive available. Yep. Okay. Yeah. One of the nice things about PowerShell is that whenever a new volume or a partition is is mounted, um, PowerShell will automatically populate a new PS drive so that you can do an LS on the newly mounted partition. All right. So. Where is this going to potentially be stored? It's going to be in EFI system partition, Microsoft boot, in a P7B file. Okay. Uh, when there's a custom policy that is deployed via the EFI system partition, it's going to be named sipolicy.p7b. Uh, when SI policy, I was never really that clear on the purpose of this thing, like I think it's some default in pol uh, policy that can be inherited from or something like that. Um, we, we'd have to reach out to, to Microsoft to get more context for that. But hey, why don't we at least copy it over to, to the desktop and recover the XML and, and go through that. Um, so I could do, yeah, I can do an LS on that and then just copy item, destination, current directory. Yep, okay, cool. Um, yeah, sure, so why don't we recover the XML from that so I can show you how this works. So you supply the um, the binary file path, so we'll give it winSI policy, and then you give the XML file path that you want to name it when it recovers the XML. So we'll just call this .xml. Uh, question in chat, when you have questions about PowerShell that can't be answered by the docs, who do you reach out to? Um, some great people to reach out to, um, like on Twitter would be Lee Holmes. Um, especially if it's like security related questions. He's, he's a great resource. Um, Carlos Perez, myself, uh, Matt Nelson, Lee Christensen. <laughs> um, there's a ton of great references, um, great people on, on Twitter who, who you can reach out to. All right. Oh, let's see. What is the problem here? What did I screw up? Well, do we have a bug here?
or could this possibly be related to code integrity enforcement? All right, so this is located in WDAC tools, um, WDAC auditing. No, not WDAC auditing, CI policy parser. And where is it complaining? It's complaining line 3,230. I hope you don't mind live debugging. Um, I personally don't mind it. Bugs surface all the time and I actually don't mind walking, walking through the process of figuring this stuff out. So it says that this type is not loaded when new object is being called. And this is something that, this is a, like a .NET type that I defined in the script. So we'd have to figure out why that type is not being loaded. Because there should be a call up here to add type. Yeah, so like here's all the C sharp source code, which I call add type on. All right, and I check to see if this type exists. Let's kind of, let's just manually validate that. So, okay, that is there. So why, why is supplemental signers not present? Let's see, we can search for that. Supplemental signers. Um, okay, so, oh, is this, this isn't the bug that we fixed, is it? Probably is. Um, so 3,230. All right, so is this thing, even defined? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Lee Christensen fixed this for me. All right. I think we will have a solution here shortly. Supplemental policy signers, could that be it? I think so. Okay. Oh yeah, so Right, so I create an array of supplemental signers here and then iterate through something and then create a new supplemental signer. So, okay, yep, I'm pretty sure this is the bug that Lee Christensen submitted a PR for and I just haven't bothered to update this in my... Um, in my VM. Oh, you know what? Let's see. Because add type was called, that um, type was like baked in, so I can't redefine it. Um, so let's just try this again. Yay! Yay for me. Fixing bugs live. Fixing bugs that Lee already fixed. Okay, so that was a fun little detour.
Let's look at that XML. All right, so remember this came from the EFI system partition. And my understanding is that this uh, win SI policy is, um, what, what is the deal with this? Actually, I, this is interesting. Yeah, this is, uh, this is nothing that I'm familiar with actually. Whoa, look at that. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it would probably help if I, <laughs> if I actually uh, talk through what I'm looking at here. Um, we've covered uh, reading these policies in, in a previous stream, but we'll, we'll kind of give a refresher here. So um, this is a policy that was designed as a base policy. So one of the newer features of Defender Application Control is that you can have multiple base policies and then you can have policies that supplement your base policies um, up to a total of 32 policies. So um, this is a base policy for something. Um, what it is, I'm not entirely sure, um, but it has options enabled like UMCI or user mode code integrity. Um, it requires uh, WICWL or Windows Hardware Quality Lab uh, signatures for device drivers. Um, developer mode dynamic code trust um, is related to I believe that setting is related to this blog post that I put out many years ago um, on a generic, um, well, it was called Device Guard at the time, Device Guard uh, bypass, where any signed code that compiles C sharp code on the fly and then loads it into its process was subject to code integrity bypass. So this feature was, uh, was implemented to, to mitigate um, that class of, of bypass. Okay, apparently this, this base policy is designed to be supplemented. Um, if, if deployed and enforced, um, if somehow this policy was to um, screw up and the operating system would not boot, we can still recover it by getting back into the advanced boot options menu, um, disabling uh, code integrity enforcement. Of course, like in, in order to do that, you'd have to disable uh, secure boot. Um, but there's a, there's a, a rip cord for us to, to pull if, if we needed to, if something got screwed up. Um, it's applicable to Microsoft Store applications. Uh, it can be updated without having to reboot. And um, conditional Windows lockdown policy. Uh, I forget what that is. And I think James Forshaw has a blog post on it. I would put money on that. Yup. So James has developed many a bypass as well. All right. So anyway, uh, you can you can read his post on that. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, okay, so EKUs or enhanced key usages. One of the cool things about Defender Application Control is that you can supplement your rules with specific EKUs. And I mentioned previously, like what these are for is, um, it's a way that you can um, specify a specific purpose for a code signing certificate. So for example, um, Anything, oh, okay, well, here's a good one. You know that something is signed, is Windows signed, that is Microsoft signed, but using a special certificate, 
that is only applied to signed code that's um, built into the operating system if this EKU is applied. Okay. And so I, I think it's cool that you can have like very granular uh, policy um, by specifying the, the EKUs to apply to a rule. So we have a bunch of deny rules in here. Uh, some of you pen testers, red teamers may recognize some of these things as um, potential bypasses. So MS build, one of the, the big ones out there um, that's great at subverting code integrity enforcement, uh, assuming you don't have an explicit block rule for it. Um, that was discovered by, by Casey Smith way back in the day. Uh, I discovered this one um, maybe a couple years ago. Um, so I don't, yeah, I mean, it seems as though there's fairly decent um, block coverage here. But let's see, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I found run script helper. I'm just like going through my mental model of like <laughs> all of the um, code integrity bypasses using uh, like Microsoft or Windows sign code that come to mind. I'm trying to think through if like anything is missing here. Um, I know, well, a Microsoft signed one that comes to mind uh, that Casey Smith found was uh, msxsl.exe. Like a really old uh, utility that is signed by Microsoft. It's not Windows signed. Um, there's also BG Info. Um, that's one of the tools Microsoft signed in Sys internals that um, that Advar discovered back in the day. So like that's not included. Um, I'm trying to think. Like are all of these Windows signed utilities? And I believe. They are. Actually, I don't. I don't think these interactive script interpreters are. So this is the um, the C sharp interpreter, F sharp interpreter, uh, both bypasses discovered by Matt Nelson. Right. Anyway, um, so the intent here is to uh, to block those while. Uh, presumably allowing anything else signed by Windows to to execute. So here are those signer rules, um, some of which have a corresponding EKU assigned to them. Uh, I mentioned in a previous stream these uh, TBS values. TBS stands for to be signed. To be signed is the hash of the certificate that was used uh, to sign the code. Um, where a TBS hash differs from a thumbprint is that, here, let me show you a thumbprint what that looks like. So built-in command let get authentic code signature. Let's just run it on kernel 32. So this is a thumbprint. A thumbprint is the SHA-1 hash of the certificate. TBS hash is the hash of the certificate using the hashing algorithm that is specified in the certificate. So you can pull the hashing algorithm If we were going to do it through PowerShell this way, we would do signer certificate. Let's pull out all the properties here. Uh, signature algorithm. Yep. So the TBS hash of, in this case, like this certificate here, if it was to be hashed, it would be the, the SHA-256 hash of the certificate. That took me forever to realize like what that actually corresponded to. So hence uh, me wanting to share that knowledge with you as well.
So like, I don't actually know what these correspond to. Um, we'd have to do some digging to kind of reverse like what these actually correspond to. And of course this is kind of uh, interesting slash concerning. Um, I don't know, but also like this WinSI policy um, is not actually utilized to my knowledge. Um, but anyway, it's, it's definitely a, a, an interesting find. All right, now here is the, the driver specific policy. So for the driver rules, we only have allow rules, okay? There are no explicit deny rules here. For as far as the, um, so this signing scenario refers to the user mode policy. So when you see signing scenario windows, think that's, that's the uh, user mode policy. So we do have those explicit deny rules applied as well as some allow rules. Okay. Okay, so we get a little bit of it. Oh, okay, interesting. So, all right, this appears to be the Windows 10S policy. So if like the, yeah, the default Windows 10S policy, even though this SKU of Windows is not Windows 10S, evidently they include it in Windows anyway. Perhaps that is to support the scenario of um, changing your SKU from Windows 10 Pro or Windows 10 Enterprise over to Windows 10S. I think that's a supported scenario, but that's largely speculation. Um, but anyway, the, this is kind of interesting. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at the Windows 10S policy and it seems as though they've updated it a little bit. So this process that I just went through is the workflow that like me as a quote unquote attacker would go through to um, audit a policy and attempt to identify uh, potential bypasses. Now, I mentioned, like as we were talking through some of the things that are explicitly denied, I know pretty much all of these are Windows signed, and I know the Windows 10S policy to only allow um, Windows signed code to execute. Well, and, and Windows or, or Microsoft store code to execute as well. So any, any standard Microsoft signed code, like Microsoft signed stuff that isn't included in the operating system would not be allowed to run in Windows 10 S. So things like, uh, BG info or MS XSL.exe. They're not going to be allowed to run in the first place. So, um, my my thought process for potential bypasses would be, um, okay, like, are there any other law bins that I'm aware of that perhaps Microsoft neglected to include in this block list here? And one way to cross-reference that, aside from going to the, the LOLBAS, like L-O-L-B-A-S um, repo, which if, if you're not familiar with that, it's um, maintained by Advar over at uh, Trusted Sec. It's a really cool project where um, he and the community maintain this list of, um, of LOL bins. Now it's, it's important to note that uh, just by the nature of a binary being listed in here, it, it's not necessarily going to subvert code integrity. So now you can look at binaries that are marked AWL bypass. Um, I'm not sure how this tagging works. Um, 
Oh, by type, maybe. Is that how that would work? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Come on. Um, so, yeah, referring to something as an application whitelisting bypass um, is relatively subjective because not all application whitelisting or application control uh, solutions are created equally. For example, Defender Application Control um, enforces code integrity on all portable executable files. So that includes EXEs. Well, assuming you have a uh, you've enabled UMCI user mode code integrity, it's going to enforce policy on any portable executable file, regardless of its extension, like DLL. Whereas uh, AppLocker, by default, um, does not enforce um, a DLL policy. Um, Defender Application Control, on the other hand, doesn't care. There's not even an option to say, do not enforce uh, DLL um, code integrity. Like that's not a thing for application control. So not all AWL bypasses are created equally. When you hear me refer to uh, an app control bypass, I will generally um, scope it to Defender Application Control um, considering like I consider that to be, uh, like from a technical implementation perspective to be like the strongest application control solution out there. Now from a manageability and scalability perspective, like that's another matter. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Um, but, uh, that's, that's, um, the bar that I set for myself when I want to seek out and develop a um, an application control bypass. Okay, um, another thing that you can reference is Microsoft's uh, documented recommend, uh, recommended block rules. Now this list is not always going to be in lockstep with the Windows 10S policy. So when Microsoft gets, gets wind that there is uh, Lulbin that also happens to bypass code integrity enforcement. Um, you're most likely to see it reflected in here first, and then there's probably going to be a lag time between that and when it would be updated in, in Windows 10S, if you even care about Windows 10S in the first place, which I can't imagine um, there are too many people who do. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I would just cross-reference this for some potential ideas for bypasses and and just in general like if you land on a system that has defender application control enforced and they don't have these explicit deny rules in their policy well then there's an obvious bypass so like if they didn't have ms build explicitly blocked in there head on over to lulbaz pull up the reference information for MS build and you're up and running and you'll completely bypass uh, code integrity enforcement. All right. Let's go back to actually recovering the policies that I have deployed to this system instead of messing around with that uh, Windows 10S policy. All right, so the binary file path we want to recover is in C Windows system 32, code integrity. Now there were two um, CIP files in here. All right, so we'll call this first one just policy zero.
and we can go through and audit this. All right, so this is a, it's a base policy. We can see the, the options that were enabled. So what's interesting to me is that user mode code integrity is enabled. Um, audit mode is being enforced. Um, it's an unsigned policy, which is interesting. So if we are running elevated as an attacker, then we could just update the policy to allow all. And that, that would be easy. And it, it would be even easier to do because update policy, no reboot is specified. So we can just deploy a new allow all policy, refresh the policy without having to reboot, and we've completely subverted Defender Application Control. All right. um, there are definitely mitigations around that, and I've already mentioned them. Um, namely, code integrity policy signing and virtualization-based security, or um, like that, that UEFI protection of um, the, the policy where if you wanted to like brute force remove the policy, like you'd, you'd have to have physical access um, to, to remove that. All right, so this, this is my policy that we generated in a, in a previous uh, stream. And what do we have going on here? What are all these hashes? Oh, these are probably related to um, like PowerShell scripts. Um, now, one of the challenging things about auditing Defender Application Control policies from like an attacker's perspective is that not all of the original metadata is uh, can be recovered. So you can have like friendly names for your rules. Um, those are not stored in the in the binary policy. So um, what I believe this, oops, um, one second. Okay, what I believe this policy corresponds to is uh, this this one here merged. XML. So let me just show you this here for comparison. Yeah, here we go. So here are all these um, allow rules followed by the, the hashes. And then let's go over to policy zero. All right. So let me just double check as a sanity check that, for example, this hash is present in there. Yep. Yeah, it's in there. And um, the, the, the order of these rules is not always going to be maintained when you recover the policy. Um, so you just kind of have to deal with that. So between the order not being maintained, which like me as the person who developed that script to recover it, I, ha I have no control over uh, recovering the original um, order in which rules were declared, nor can I recover the... Um, the friendly name properties. Again, because those are not, um, uh, the, those are not present in the binary policy. So there's nothing that I can do when I recover those. So I try my best. Um, so anyway, like that, that's what makes this a little more challenging to, to audit. Okay. So we have some more allow rules. And um, yeah, there are no explicit deny rules in here. So right off the bat, um, perhaps like I'm thinking my bypass strategy would be to simply run one of the built-in uh, law bins like MS build to subvert the policy. But Remember, there was another CIP policy in here. So we'll recover that. Call that policy one. And 
And um, yeah, there are lots of deny rules in here. Lots of deny rules by hash, which is kind of interesting. I mentioned in a previous stream that creating deny rules by hash is um, can lend itself to not being extremely robust, especially when you're dealing with blocking um, bypass scripts that have an embedded authentic code signature. And we're, we're gonna cover that in, in just a moment here, um, how I would go about bypassing that. Um, so here's some more readable deny rules. All right, uh, looks like it's a no-go for MS build. It's a no-go for probably all of the built-in uh, bypasses that, that I'm aware of. And this policy was um, designed to only allow Windows sign code. So um, even if say I had a vulnerable version of BG info, it wouldn't work because BG info is not Windows signed, it's Microsoft signed. So that wouldn't run anyway. which uh, I think I have sys internals on here. So that, that would be a good, um, a good check. So if I ran process explorer, okay, we got that. And it did run because it was in audit mode. And um, I can quickly audit whether or not that was logged with get wdac code integrity events i'll look at the user mode events since last policy refresh and yep indeed if defender application control was in enforcement mode process explorer would have been blocked but it was just audited All right, so what next? Where do we, where do we wanna go with, um, with bypasses here? Um, yeah, let me go to my dirty little agenda document and make sure we covered everything. All right, so we've covered how to determine the enforcement status of Defender, Defender Application Control, um, locating, and recovering binary code and uh, integrity policies. Cool. So I think as far as like auditing is concerned, um, there's a lot more that could be said um, related to like auditing methodology. Um, that's all kind of boring in my opinion. Um, so I, I say we move on to, to bypasses, um, especially in, in the interest of, of time here. Um, if there are any questions related to auditing, please ask away. Um, but let's dive into bypasses. So um, <clears throat> I would categorize bypasses into the following categories, right? So um, are, we, are we attempting to bypass code integrity enforcement as like not running elevated or running elevated? If you're running elevated, that's gonna open up um, new attack avenues, right? Now, Defender Application Control was designed to mitigate against a broad class of admin level attacks, um, but many of those mitigations have to explicitly be enabled. For example, um, again, signing your policy and using um, virtualization-based security to protect your your policy. Um, okay, question. Have I seen WDAC manage across an org? Um, yes, I have. Um, have I seen it deployed at scale? Um, not at a large scale, no. Um, I've seen it deployed um, to 
to servers and a small subset of like special purpose clients. Like um, a good use case for like client deployments would be like privilege access workstations. And um, yeah, your question uh, related to group policy. Um, yeah, in most of those cases, the policy was deployed via via group policy. Um, namely, there's there's a group policy setting where you specify the path to where the code integrity policy is stored, and then upon signing in, uh, um, the yeah it it will reach out to wherever that policy is stored, copy it, and deploy it accordingly. Um, there's other deployment scenarios as well. For example, like using um, like Microsoft Intune. And um, there's also an option in, uh, available for deployment via, um, why is the name escaping me? But like, I, I, can't, I can't remember the other deployment scenario. Um, it's, it's at the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember. Anyway. Good question. Okay, so are we not admin or admin? That's gonna affect um, our attack strategy. And then how we go about subverting the policy, um, there are different strategies for that as well. So we just covered how you can like read through the recovered XML and audit it to determine if there was anything that the policy builder missed in terms of blocking, right? So like I've kind of used like MS build as the canonical example. Like if there's not an explicit deny rule blocking MS build, then code integrity is bypassed, right? Uh, another example, if, um, if PowerShell is allowed to run, uh, we covered in a previous stream, um, PowerShell uh, constrained language mode, which is a really good mitigation against PowerShell attacks when Defender Application Control or App Locker are enforced. Um, that's not a thing if you have PowerShell version two installed. Like PowerShell version two does not understand uh, constrained language mode. so there's another potential bypass. So um, if you have PowerShell v2 installed by default, um, I would certainly recommend removing that. Um, Lee Holmes also did a blog post on how you can uh, use code integrity to block previous versions of the PowerShell DLL, uh, system.management.automation.dll. So that, that's a great uh, resource if um, via code integrity policy you want to block older versions of, of PowerShell that are not um, constrained language mode aware. Okay. Um, another strategy would be uh, Defender Application Control Implementation Bypass. Um, so what do I mean by that? That could be like a, that, that could be like discovering a new law bin that uh, was previously unknown. It could be if there is a fundamental flaw in the implementation of Defender Application Control, um, there's an opportunity there. Um, and then there's code signing implementation bypasses. We're gonna cover one of these in, in a minute um, in relation to uh, script signing. And then as an admin, um, if you're dealing with an unsigned code integrity policy, well then you can just update it to have an allow all uh, policy, or you can just disable the policy, but um, that will likely require a, a reboot to take effect. Um, let's talk about code signing implementation bypasses. So I did a post a while back on, where are we? Here. Um, where I talk about so in the Microsoft recommended block list, they have a bunch of hash-based deny rules. So I was interested to know like how we, how I could go about bypassing those rules. Cause like 
blocking by hash is potentially problematic, right? So let's say that let's say that there was a assigned PowerShell script that was coded in some insecure fashion that I don't know, for example, allowed us to call add type. All right, so consume C sharp code, compile it, and load it into PowerShell such that we can interact with it um, and bypass constraint language mode. Okay. So, unlike with uh, portable executable files, where you can have a block rule that says, hey, block by file name. And by the way, this is not the file name on disk. Rather, it is the original file name specified in the PE file. So, um, in the case of bash.exe, its original file name in the PE file is specified as bash.exe. And if an attacker were to modify that, like to, to rename bash.exe to something else, um, it would still be blocked because in doing so, you've invalidated the signature. So it's no longer signed at that point. So that's why the block rules for PE files are relatively robust. The same cannot be said for scripts because, all right, let's, let's just pretend that that hypothetical vulnerable PowerShell script that we found um, was blocked by hash. Well, Microsoft would ideally have to go through their historical code bases to find all variants of that same PowerShell script. Because like, let's say throughout history, there were various updates made to it but updates that didn't address the fundamental code integrity bypass, Microsoft would be on the hook to try to uh, identify all of those vulnerable scripts and then create um, uh, hash-based deny rules. Um, now, another thing that they could, well, one, one consideration is that here, let's look at let's look at a, a PowerShell script. Well, uh, let me just let me copy it over. So I'm just gonna take a random PowerShell script. Um, a couple weeks ago, we looked at some of these absolutely horrid scripts. These uh, Windows troubleshooting pack scripts. Sure, whatever. Let, let's let's take this one. And if you call get authentic code signature on that, it is signed. Now let's call get content on that. And um, looking through it, it's not very long. There is not an embedded signature in it. All right, so how is it signed? So it is catalog signed. If it had an embedded authentic code signature in it, signature type would be authentic code. All right, a catalog signature, if you're not familiar with these things is, um, where are these things? See windows, cat root. All right, so in this directory are a ton of these .cat or catalog files, which are essentially a list of hashes. And that list or the, the .cat file itself is signed. Uh, so one potential mitigation that Microsoft has up their sleeve is they can implicitly invalidate signatures for older binaries or scripts or whatever um, by simply shipping a later version of Windows that doesn't have that corresponding catalog signature. So what that means is like, let's say that this script was vulnerable today and we could use this to subvert code integrity enforcement. 
Microsoft at a later date fixes this. And so, and then they ship Windows with the fixed version, which will be signed. But then when they ship Windows with the new version, the hash of the old version will no longer be contained within these catalog files. So if an attacker had the clever idea to bring the old version over to the compromised system, it's not going to be allowed to execute because it, it has ceased to be signed because there's no longer a catalog signature for that old vulnerable version. Now, it's, it's going to be the case that, well, my understanding is that the majority of scripts that are built into the OS are predominantly catalog signed. So that's, that's a good thing to me. Now, um, in the case of where you have a, um, a script with an embedded authentic code signature, that's where things can get potentially problematic because Microsoft can't at a later date remove that signature because it's embedded in the file. All right. So let's look for, where's this thing stored? I'm going to look for an old, uh, an old bypass courtesy of Matt Nelson. which has since been fixed. Um, but here, just to cross-reference, let's, we can search here for pubprn.vbs. And um, yeah, there's, so you can see Microsoft has blocked many of these <clears throat> versions by, by hash. Um, so here's what we can do. Let's look at this version. And I, I wanna just make sure that this isn't like one of the vulnerable versions that's supposed to be blocked. So I can just get its file hash. And how are they storing the hash in this policy? Uh, this looks like is that a SHA-256? Probably. Yeah, that's SHA-256. So I would just um, just copy this and search for that and it's not in there. Um, I tell you what, you know what? Here on my host, I've got um, I got virus total, and I'm able to potentially pull some of these down. So let me take um, I don't know. Uh, let me just try this one and see if it's in virus total over here. So just bear with me. Nope, that is not in virus total. Uh, let's try this one. That one is not. Um, that one is not. That one is not. <laughs> um, now we could also just <clears throat> reference older versions as well um, and go that route. I was hoping I could just easily pull one of these down. Oh yeah, I found one, okay. Cool, so I'm gonna download that and I'm going to bring it over to my guest VM here so that you can actually see what I'm doing. Okay. All right.
right here is our pubpern vuln dot bbs. All right. So if we look at this file, go down to the bottom, you'll see that it is, uh, it has an embedded authentic code signature. All right. Now I wonder, does Matt have a blog post on this? Yay, okay. All right, so what's he doing here? Oh, he's pulling a, he's using it to pull a, a com scriptlet down. Let me see if there's a good, um, oh, it's on lawbaz, sweet. Okay, um, where's this stored? So let's do this. All right, pop calc, let's try this. Um, so theoretically, if we do this and call pubpern vuln. Oh. And then point that to that raw gist scriptlet. Fingers crossed. Um, ah, script colon. Oops. <laughs> All right, so error path, perhaps that's because defender killed it. Got to give Defender credit sometimes. Yeah, see. So yeah, it blocked the um, the the cached version. Okay, let's try that again. Yay! All right, sweet. So that worked. It ran the. The com scriptlet. <laughs> hey Brian, what's up, man? Okay. Um, all right. So where was I going with this? All right. So the the file hash for pubpern was this one, and I think that is what was reflected in the block list. Yes, indeed. Okay. Now, that, in theory, if uh, enforcement mode was enabled, that script would have been blocked. Um, I would like to validate that. Okay, awesome. So that, that would have been blocked. Um, as a refresher, uh, any, any script-based policy in your code integrity policy, if it is audited or enforced, um, those are logged in the app locker uh, script and MSI event log. So um, 
and WDAC tools has a dedicated function to, to pull those out. All right, here's the fun part. All right, so what do we do with this? So it's blocked by hash. And let's just assume that this is the only vulnerable version that we'll ever be able to find, okay? Only one, ever. Um, what, what options do we have here? So we can, here, let me make a copy of this since we're gonna screw around with this. We go to edit. Um, and let's go back here. And I just would like to prove to you that PubPern is indeed signed. Again, this is the one that I pulled from VirusTotal. Um, but by the nature of it having that embedded authentic code signature, there is no catalog signature um, that Microsoft can later like invalidate invalidating the signature of an older version, okay? So this is signed, um, but it is currently not allowed by policy because there's that hash rule in place, okay? Now, what if I just like, what if I attempted to somehow modify the file hash? Because um, if I modified the file hash, and made it such that it retained its valid signature, then it would be allowed, right? So I don't know, what can I do? Like just add a, add a new line there? Nope, signature is invalidated. I can't do that. You wanna see something funny? New file hash. Uh, where was the old one? Um, the okay, new file hash and the old file hash. All right. Um, yeah, let's do this. Uh, go back to the audit script. Let me just let me just pull out the first um, I don't know four events. I'll pull out those first three. All right, so these are these are the old ones, right? So uh, actually, here look. So get file hash. Um, this happened to use the SHA one file hash, so that's fine. This is the the original version. Uh, let's specify SHA-1, okay, yep, so we have a match. The SHA-1 hash of this one is different, right? Um, so what I'd like to do is execute it. Okay, so we're gonna execute the modified version. One, validate that it executes, which it, it does indeed. Okay, and then see if, um, if this would have been blocked if we were in enforcement mode. Uh, do you see this hash anywhere in there? All right. So um, I mentioned at the beginning of the stream that um, like any any bypass that uh, I was going to mention has like generally has a mitigating control. This is an exception. Um, I did report this to Microsoft a while back, and um, 
let's see. They did eventually claim a fix for this, for this bypass. Um, but I don't actually know what that fix was like, um, I, and I, I reported this variation as well, but nothing was really done with it. So um, anyway, I, I just want to drive the point home that <clears throat> this is like an unsolved issue with um, with script code that has an embedded authentic code signature in it. So again, just to, um, to summarize all this, the scenario is you have script code, so like, PowerShell, VBScript, JScript that have an embedded authentic code signature in them, meaning they can't later be invalidated due to uh, a refreshed uh, catalog signature. And they are vulnerable such that they allow subverting code integrity policy, as is the case with pubprn.vbs. All right. So as you saw, it was blocked by hash. And again, there is not a, by the nature of these being scripts, there is no metadata contained within the script like there is within PE files, a la original file name, from which uh, a more robust block rule could be implemented. The only choice you have is to block by hash. So Brian has perhaps a stupid question. No, there are no stupid questions. Um, but anyway, the, the question is, can you use that to actually inject meaningful executable code into the section that doesn't break the signature? No. So if I understand the question correctly, um, can I use this like this bypass trick to, I don't know, maybe inject code like down here at the bottom i don't know no so i can't put it there um i can't put it there okay um <clears throat> There's a lot of different variations that could be attempted. And um, the, the answer is no. You, um, I have not found a way in PowerShell or um, uh, VBS or JScript code to modify the signature such that you can insert executable code. Caveat. Um, I did report a vulnerability where um, you could inject, um, so there, there was a file confusion, like a signed, signable file confusion vulnerability I found where I took the, um, the CAB and the MSI file format, both of which are file formats which can be signed. And every signable file format, if it supports having an embedded authentic code signature in it, the way in which those signatures are inserted and the way in which the file's signature is calculated is dependent upon the file type. So for example, an MSI file, um, when its signature is calculated, it's not just a raw like file hash. It's like the, the signature isn't like, okay, what, what is the, the file hash of the file up to where the signature is? No, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, there's a collection of fields or streams within the file format that are only considered uh, when calculating the hash against which the signature is validated. And so the idea that I had was to consider 
like take the CAB or the MSI file format, hunt through um, signed MSIs or CABs built into the operating system that have an embedded Authenticode signature. So, I mean, I, I basically did the equivalent of like this, LSC colon star recurse include, if I was just looking at MSI, I would do that, right? And then for everyone returned, I did get authentic code signature where um, signature type equals authentic code. Okay. So it appears like, yeah, there's, well, the, these aren't built in. These are included in the, the Windows SDK, which I installed after the fact. Um, but anyway, so that like that was my my workflow is like using something like this to identify signed MSI files that had an embedded authentic code signature, and then to identify the portions of the file format that did not have the um their signatures the the signature validated so there there were a handful of portions within the file um that were not validated and so what i was able to do in that case was uh insert little snippets of, of powershell code within that uh within the msi um i'm gonna oversimplify the actual weaponization of that but that's what i was able to do like insert PowerShell code within the signed MSI file. And then I renamed the MSI file to .ps1, or well, um, I renamed it to .psm1 just because I was in a constrained language mode environment. So, um, and then I called import module on that PSM1 file, which was actually a signed MSI file and I was able to bypass uh, code integrity enforcement. And one of the reasons I was able to get away with that is because by the nature of renaming the MSI to a PS1 file, um, the way that um, well, things start to get a little complicated here, the, um, there's a specific order in which the operating system validate signatures All right so like if i do if i do get authentic code signature on pubpern like how does windows know how to extract this signature material from the file right um and the answer to that is SIPs or subject interface packages. So these are DLLs that implement all the logic that when you go to sign a, uh, a signable file type, the operating system under the hood knows the correct um, subject interface package DLL to use to insert the signature. Or in the case of signature validation, this is the code that's used to extract that signature material. Um, now, the way some um, signatures are retrieved can depend on uh, magic byte sequences in the file, or they can depend upon the file extension. So the more robust option, if it makes sense to do so, would be to identify a file, a signable file type based on magic values. And so that is what's done for uh, PE files, All right? So if I did, um, like if I copied C Windows System 32, uh, kernel32.dll to foo.txt, right? A, a text file is not like inherently a signable file type, right? But if I did get authentic code signature on foo.txt, it's still gonna show up as signed because under the hood, the 
subject interface package DLL that's responsible for validating the signature of portable executable files, like a DLL, um, recognizes that foo.txt is a portable executable portable executable file based on um, magic byte sequences within the, the, the file itself. Um, you can't exactly do that with script code, right? So like, if I write a script, well, here, let, let me show you this. Um, so let's look at pubpern again, right? Like, you can read the source code and be like, yeah, this looks like VBScript code. Like if you're knowledgeable enough to know that this looks like VBScript code, but from like a code perspective, like there's no magic byte sequence that would tell the operating system, hey, this is actually VBS code and VBS code can have an embedded signature. So how does it know? Well, in this case, it has to go by file extension. But if I copy this to pubpern.txt, all right, uh, Windows gets confused, all right. So that's why some of those SIP DLLs, subject interface package DLLs, um, have to go by file extension um, because there is no magic byte sequence that can be identified or present in script code. Script code just being text, really. So, um, so that the nature of that bypass, that signed, um, that sign, signable file type confusion vulnerability was I had like injected .msi, right? So I had injected PowerShell code in it, in the file. Um, and then I renamed it to PSM1. Yeah. And then because, and then when I called um, import module on it, you would expect injected.psm1 to have this similar unknown error because when the SIP DLL comes by and says, oh, okay, I'm dealing with PowerShell code here. I know how to deal with embedded PowerShell script signatures, but then it would probably be really confused when it sees this like seemingly arbitrary byte blob, which is actually an MSI, but because MSI, sign, signable uh, MSIs are considered uh, prior to PowerShell signed code, and MSIs are identified as um, based on byte sequences, that's why I was able to get away with that, so. Um, yeah, long, long tangent there, but there could potentially be some other opportunities to introduce that, um, that signature uh, confusion. Um, so anyway, just if, if that's something anyone here would be interested in digging into, there, there, there could very well be some, um, some bypass opportunity there. But yeah, that was, that, that was a fun bypass, but um, Going back to like, can I insert just like random script code here? No, the, the SIP DLL is smart enough or is robust enough to tell the difference. All right, cool. All right. Um, are there any questions about that class of bypass?
If you think of one, let me know. I'm trying to think what else I can cover here with the with the time that we have left. Um, so I did mention if you happen to be running elevated and you're in a scenario where you have a deployed policy where the following boxes are checked. It's an unsigned policy and update policy no reboot. You don't have to know much about Defender Application Control to bypass that policy. What you can do is you can go into C Windows, Schemas, Code Integrity, Example Policies, and um, Microsoft conveniently supplies an allow all policy. So you can just deploy that policy and then refresh it. Um, yeah, and I've, I've covered in previous streams and it's uh, Microsoft documents how to how to deploy and, and refresh policies. So um, yeah, that's probably how I would go about doing things if like if I didn't care about <laughs> uh, retaining the original uh, production policy. Um, but as, as a pen tester or a red teamer, like I would encourage you to, to back up the original policy prior to uh, redeploying and, and allow all policy. Um, okay, so there's that. Let's see, what else was there? Oh, I did have this script code. This is, this is kind of handy. Uh, if you ever want to play around with signing code using a self-signed certificate, PowerShell includes a really convenient uh, built-in new self-signed certificate commandlet. And so um, this is the, the template that I use to create like a silly little self-signed certificate. So all I have to do is copy that in there and then I can create some, some test code here. Let me, when I write, let's see, write host foo to test.ps1. Yeah. Okay. All right, so obviously that's not signed at this point. But if we want to sign it, that is easy enough. And now it's signed. All right. And it has that embedded <clears throat> authentic code signature. Um, the reason that you get unknown error here is, let me call get authentic code signature on it again and expand out all the defined properties. Right. Because it's self-signed, this certificate that I just generated is not um, a trusted root certificate. Well, it's easy enough to, uh, to trust that. I can do export certificate. Sir. Yeah, I think I just do this. If my memory serves me correctly. Um, I think I can name it that. And then if I do import certificates, I give it a cert store location. <clears throat> Current user root. I get this nice little prompt. I hit yes. Now it's a valid signature because I just trusted my self signed certificate as a trusted root 
certificate. Um, okay. Last thing I wanted to show you, just while we're since I covered um, subverting VB script signatures, let's look at how we might be able to alter PowerShell uh, signatures. <clears throat> well, not well. Change the file hash of a PowerShell script without invalidating the hash, or sorry, without invalidating the signature. <clears throat> now it's not quite as straightforward uh, for PowerShell code. So if we go in here and let's say like we just add a new line and then check the signature on that. Okay, it's it's no longer signed. Okay, let's go back. I just reverted that change and it's valid. What if I did the same thing that I did before? All right, so just appended that and removed that line. Nope. So here's a slight um, SIP or subject interface package DLL implementation difference across uh, signable types. It appears as though the SIP DLL for PowerShell is a little more robust because it doesn't allow us to, to do that. All right, so what other options do we have? Um, last time I played with this, what you could do, let me see if this still applies, is with a hex editor. Go, yeah, edit it as hex. Go down to the bottom of the signature, and I think I can just add a null. Yep. Yeah. So here's the here's the before that's valid. Get file hash on that. Oops. Um. Yeah. Whatever. Well. Okay, so there's the original file hash. And then just by the nature of me adding a null byte to the end, I change the file hash and the signature remains intact. All right, so this is the strategy you might use if you had a vulnerable PowerShell script that subverted code integrity policy that was otherwise blocked by a hash rule. So just slightly different um, implementation to change the file hash, but keeping the same valid signature. All right. um, so going back to this Windows 10S policy, um, Whoever developed this policy was probably scared of such things and they outright block C script, W script, PowerShell, what have you. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, now, I, I've mentioned this a million times all over the place. Um, when I say PowerShell, I'm not referring to PowerShell.exe. I'm referring to the underlying PowerShell DLL, all right? So system.management.automation.dll. So therein lies a potential issue if you're outright blocking PowerShell.exe. Because the question is, are there any other built-in PowerShell hosts that we're not accounting for in our block rule. Here's another one. Okay, that was fortunately blocked. Okay. Um, so, let's 
see here. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, bear with me here. I, I want to try to do some recon and see if there are any built-in binaries within System32 that are .NET executables that take a dependency on uh, on system.management to automation. All right. So let me start by taking something that I know is one of those. Um, well, not one of those. Let's see. Um, okay. I know that is a, um, that's a .NET binary that's in system 32 and the way I would like programmatically make that determination is um, is I might do something like this um, So because this returned an assembly object, I know that this exe is a .NET exe. The next thing I'd be interested in, and I forget the property name, is uh, let's see. Maybe it's in. Oh, is it a method get? Yeah, okay, get referenced assemblies. Okay, cool. So what I would be looking for would be a referenced assembly of system.management to automation. .deal, or yeah, system.management to automation would be the assembly name. And so at one point I wrote like a little one-liner that just um, considered all EXEs and DLLs called reflection only load from on it. If it returned an assembly, I called get referenced assemblies. And if system.management.automation was one of those referenced assemblies, then um, I was interested in that. So like one of the ones that came up was, let me change this to store diag.exe. Right. There's a reference to PowerShell. So store diag.exe does something related to PowerShell. What it does, uh, we don't know, uh, but we can find out because by the nature of it being .NET code, we can simply decompile the executable and effectively recover its source code. So I'm here in DNSpy, I'm gonna to go to File, Open. There's our store diag. And what's convenient is I can just click on um, this main comment and it'll take me right to the entry point method and um, yeah we don't we don't have a ton of time left here so I'll try to breeze through my analysis um, what's nice is you can click on variables and arguments and any references will uh, to them will will be highlighted now fortunately this is like a really um, simple program and so like this quote unquote reverse engineering process is not going to take very long um, because all we have to do is scroll down a little bit and see where some PowerShell related stuff is happening. So if you're familiar with PowerShell, you would recognize these as potential PowerShell commandlets based on the naming scheme. All right. So I don't know, let's, let's take this one, right? So it looks like perhaps, um, the get volume commandlet is being executed. 
So it takes the, um, the commandlet name as a string, and what does it do with it? So it creates this PowerShell run space. It adds the command via this add command method, and then it calls invoke on it. So like my question would be from a bypass perspective, um, are there any command line arguments to store diag.exe that I could supply that would execute PowerShell on my behalf? And the short answer to that question is no. Any PowerShell related functionality happens by calling a, a literal string to execute a PowerShell commandlet. Um, now, could there be an opportunity here to indirectly get execution? The answer to that would be maybe. To answer that question, you'd have to ask yourself, or just ask, how does PowerShell know what, in this case, get volume is? Like, so, let me just start a clean PowerShell session. So I did dash NOP or no profile, just so I don't want to load up any extra modules. If I type get volume, how does PowerShell know like where get volume is implemented? So I can get some information about this. Uh, so get command, get volume. All right. Um, so it's clearly implemented somewhere, right? Like it's implemented in what module? It's implemented in the storage module. So how does PowerShell know where the storage module is located? So I can do get module storage. And where is this thing located? That's located here. OK. All right. So I'll, I'll try to make this quick. The answer to how, like, how PowerShell knows to resolve that function properly is something called, we'll do get item on PS module, wait. Yeah, let's do this. Uh, ENV PS module path. Why am I, uh, why am I forgetting this syntax? Oh yeah, is it dollar? Yep, okay. Just so the output's a little, a little more clear for you. Uh, there's something called uh, module auto loading. So when I typed get volume, here and I'll, load up another PowerShell session, and I will show you all of the modules that are currently loaded, okay? Get volume was stored in the storage module, right? But that module isn't loaded, but I still was able to call get volume, and then the storage module was loaded from, from here, all right? But the way uh, mo module auto loading works is it, PowerShell will look in this order, in this specific order. So you saw that that PSD1 file, that module manifest for the storage module, uh, was located in Windows uh, System32. So could there be an opportunity perhaps for us to um, hijack execution or hijack the module load order? And I think the answer is yes. So let's try that. 
Um, go in here. Okay, that directory is not defined, nor is that. That's okay. Here, let's do this. We'll do. Ah. Make dir on that. And make dir on that slash modules. Okay. <clears throat> Now, to define a module, what we need to do is we have to create a module name and store it within a folder of the same name. So let's call our module foo module. And then within that directory, we need a file named foo module <coughs> dot PSM one and let's set this thing up um, here. Let me do this. Okay. We'll create a new function and we'll just happen to call it get volume. And um, why don't we do this? We'll call, we'll get the current date time and then we'll write that to a file. Um, well, let's write it to an explicit directory here. Why don't I do C test? And we'll just, anytime this runs, we will append it. Oops. Um, so I'm going to put that in here. Okay. Now just as a, as a sanity check, uh, let's call get volume. Now is that owned dot text there? It sure is. All right. So now, if I do get command on get volume, you now see that it was loaded via my hijacked module, foo module. All right. Now let's get this test going. Um, just to show you, I'm not playing any tricks on you. I'm going to delete owned.txt. Okay. That is no longer there. And here, why don't I just do this in a separate prompt? So I just ran store diag.exe, did not supply any command line arguments. Uh, it, it takes a little bit to run. I, I don't know what it's doing. It's doing like storage diagnostics apparently, and that takes time. Um, but here, let's see if that file exists. It sure does. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, this bypass does not, because of the way that this implements its PowerShell logic, this particular executable is not subject to a constrained language mode bypass. So that's good. Um, but I wanted to show you this specific like security research example of going from um, yeah, so here in uh, Win SI policy, this is the Windows 10S policy. You see PowerShell.exe and these other PowerShell hosts, including like I know this one to be a bypass like PowerShell host, um, are explicitly blocked, but uh, I can still fortunately on a Windows 10S system, like if I was really, really wanting to get PowerShell code to run, I would have that option um, by executing store diag.exe. So I don't know about you, that, that was kind of fun. 
Um, hope, hope y'all enjoyed that. Um, are there any last minute questions before I sign off here for the evening? No? Okay. Cool. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, again, just want to acknowledge how valuable your time is, including my own. Uh, it means a lot that you would spend your, your evening with me. So again, thank you very much. Um, and as usual, uh, I'm going to put these recordings up on, on uh, YouTube as well, so you can catch the recording anytime. Alrighty, everyone. Have a fantastic evening. We'll chat later.